Welcome everyone to today's lecture on weapons of mass destruction, artificial intelligence and international law by Professor Simon Chesterman. Professor Chesterman is the Dean and Provost Chair Professor of the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law and Senior Director of AI Governance at AI Singapore. Professor Chesterman is the author or editor of 21 books, including We the Robots, Regulating Artificial Intelligence and the Limits of the Law, which was published this year. The, more, the moderator for today's session is Dr. Nilofer Orel, Director for NUS Center for International Law. Without further delay, we will now begin the lecture. Um, thank you, Zi Peng. And uh, first of all, on behalf of uh, Patricia and myself, we would like to welcome all the participants uh, to our guest lecture today. And we are also being live streamed on Facebook. So we, we welcome and greet everyone who is watching us from Facebook. Uh, we are both extremely, uh, especially delighted to have as our special guest lecturer today, Professor Simon Chesterman, who is Dean of the NUS Law School. Uh, Professor Chesterman is a person of many achievements. Uh, in addition to his very successful leadership of the NUS Law School. And he's also a board, uh, member of the Board of Governors of the Center for International Law. He is a world recognized international law scholar. Uh, and as Ji Feng said, he has many publications, but also an author of several books. Um, so today um, we are, I think I'm really looking forward uh, to his lecture today. It's a wonderful title. Weapons of Mass Destruction, Artificial Intelligence, and International Law. This could not be a more timely and current and important topic. And no other person uh, to talk about this than uh, Professor Chesterman. Professor Chesterman, thank you again for accepting our invitation. You are a very busy person. And so please, I turn over the floor to you. Thanks, Jifeng, and thanks, Nilofer. It's, it's a great pleasure to be with you all virtually. Um, I'm sorry we can't be in the same room, uh, but candidly, one of the reasons why I accepted the invitation uh, is that the Center for International Law is really dear to my heart, and the Academy is especially dear to my heart because uh, every time I've spoken at it, um, there have been rich questions, great comments, uh, and so that's really what I'm looking forward to today. So what I'll do is I'll present for 20 or 30 minutes, um, but what I'm most looking forward to are your, your questions, comments. Uh, so I, I don't mind if you, turn, if you don't have your video on now, I'm gonna present some slides and so on, uh, but later I will ask you to turn on the videos uh, so that we can see each other when we're in discussion. Um, but just to put this in context, uh, as, as Jifeng kindly noted, um, uh, my most recent book, actually it was published last month, uh, is on regulating artificial intelligence and the limits of the law. And so what I'm gonna to present today is a, is a small part of that. I know this week you've been talking about the use of force. Uh, and so one thing that will come up is lethal autonomous weapons. Um, but really the, the question of what new technology will mean for legal regimes generally and international law in particular uh, is something that I'm hoping to tease out uh, with all of you uh, in the course of today's presentation. So let me just, um, pull up some slides so you're not just looking at the Zoom screen the whole time and hopefully this won't be too te uh, text heavy. I'm just trying to give you a, a little bit of a, an intellectual anchor to hang on to as we, as we go into these uncharted territories. So weapons of mass disruption is the, uh, uh, I didn't copy it from anyone else, but I do discover it's not original to me. Um, so uh, great minds or, or, or bad minds thinking alike. That's the title for today. So some very, very quick um, definitions. What are we talking about when we talk about uh, these terms? So artificial intelligence, I'm just using in a pretty non-technical way to refer to systems that can apply cognitive functions. So systems that can do things that a human brain could do um, in a way that would typically be done by a human. A subset of this is machine learning. Machine learning is the ability of uh, a computer to improve on its own performance without being specifically programmed to do so. 
Uh, and then robotics is how all of this interfaces with the world. So if you combine AI and machine learning, you get uh, AlphaGo. This is the, uh, the computer program that won the notoriously complex game Go. Uh, computers are already defeated us in chess and tic-tac-toe long ago, uh, but Go is an example of a machine that, that came up with new strategies itself that even at the time, the world grandmaster, Lee Sudol, uh, said, well, this is a crazy move. This makes no sense, uh, which ended up being revealed at the end to have laid the seeds of victory against this human. Combine AI and robotics, so you get pretty old technology uh, like autopilot. And if you combine machine learning and robotics, uh, you get things like the Roomba. So that's just giving you a little bit of uh, context, but this is not really a technical presentation. Um, so what is the challenge that um, artificial intelligence poses to regulation? So I, I try to break this down uh, into three types of challenge, uh, and I won't go into this in great detail, but the first and the most obvious is speed. There are all sorts of things that computers can do at a pace that humans find hard to, to deal with. Uh, and so an uh, example of this from a decade ago was the flash crash. This is uh, the 6th of May, 2010, when the, uh, the Dow, Jones stock, Dow Jones index on the New York Stock Exchange dropped a thousand points, about a trillion dollars, uh, the biggest single point drop in its history at that point. Uh, and in the space of 30 minutes, a trillion dollars gets wiped off. And then the next 15 minutes, almost all of it comes back. Uh, and at the time, no one knew what had happened. Uh, and it turned out that uh, one of the factors uh, was that there were these high frequency trading algorithms that were trading with each other, doing tens of thousands of trades a second. Uh, and they sort of spiraled out of control and then spiraled back into control. There's a more complicated version of that, but all this just to say that the speed of computer um, uh, transactions or decisions can pose a practical challenge to traditional models of regulation. So I hope that's kind of obvious. Second uh, challenge posed by artificially intelligent systems is autonomy. Um, that we, we tend to throw this term around quite a bit, uh, but autonomy uh, means that a, 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 a machine system, uh, an AI system is making decisions without additional input from humans. Uh, and so an example of this uh, is uh, when a self-driving vehicle crashes into a person, who's to blame? Uh, and this is posed as a, group, as a real problem. Actually, that particular thing is not much of a problem. Uh, there are existing uh, legal regimes that can deal with this sort of issue. Uh, and ultimately, uh, what we're seeing in driverless vehicles, for example, is a move from uh, liability of the driver towards liability of the manufacturer or potentially the owner. Uh, and insurance will move across as well. Uh, and we will see that as the devices move from greater to lesser human engagement. That's already the case. I mean, if I, if I injure Zhu Feng because I negligently crash my car into him, he might be able to sue me. If I injure him because my car blows up, he might be able to sue the manufacturer. Uh, and so we're seeing that kind of shift. And that's not particularly problematic. Um, slightly different situation when you think about lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, which is something that comes up in the context of the use of force uh, and raises real challenges. Uh, and some people would say that the problem with lethal autonomous weapons is precisely their autonomy, uh, that they're, they're taking decisions without additional human input. But why is that a problem? Uh, and here I would distinguish it from vehicles, because in the case of transportation, uh, the main problem is really, to me, just how you make it safe. I mean, every year, uh, a million people die in traffic accidents, the vast majority due to human error. And so if we have autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles, uh, I don't really see that as posing a moral problem, provided they can be safe. So if you like that, that's the kind of utilitarian lens that we want to see vehicles being safe so we can get the benefits of automation while minimizing the risks. Slightly different question when it comes to lethal autonomous weapons, where the problem is not simply that they're not safe, uh, because some people would argue, and I tend to be persuaded, that the argument that lethal autonomous weapons will always be more dangerous than humans is probably wrong. Um, there's a lot of evidence, for example, that war crimes tend to happen uh, basically because people are either racist, sexist, tired, angry, make bad decisions. These are all things that the machines are meant to be better at. But even if you could prove that a, a lethal autonomous weapon was going to be more compliant with the laws of war, uh, therefore on a utilitarian calculus, it might be less likely to violate the laws of war, less likely to cause harms. Most of us, I think, 
still have a kind of visceral reaction that we are wary of transferring this power of life uh, over life and death to an autonomous system. Not because the autonomous system will make a worse decision necessarily, uh, but because we think that this is something that a human should grapple with, and in particular that a human should be accountable for. So these questions of autonomy tend to get conflated, but, but it does pose a challenge to, uh, to regulation. A third type of challenge is opacity. Uh, and this is also something that gets thrown around a lot, but basically it means the quality of being hard to understand. Why is it hard to understand? Sometimes that's for proprietary reasons. Sometimes um, computer companies, technology companies don't want you to understand the source code, so they'll keep it proprietary. Sometimes it's because it's just difficult to understand. But law has always had ways of dealing with this. Uh, in the first case, you can have a subpoena or a court order to, to if you like, break open the black box. Uh, in the second case, you might be able to call on expert witnesses. Um, but increasingly with AI systems, machine learning, neural networks, uh, we are moving into a realm where AI systems are taking decisions on the basis of processes that humans can literally not understand, that even an expert cannot understand. They have billions of variables uh, and it's just not practical to explain it in a way that humans can comprehend. Does this matter? Not always. There are all sorts of things that happen in life where we don't actually understand the reasons. I mean, I used to fly quite a lot without necessarily understanding all of the principles of aerodynamics. We routinely use medicines where the precise molecular behavior of a pharmaceutical might not be known to us, uh, but provided it satisfies statistical methodologies, provided there's a rigorous uh, scientific testing program, uh, we're happy to go along with them uh, because we're satisfied with the statistical approach. Translate that into a courtroom, for example, with my robot judge friend here, and we might have more reason for pause. Uh, that if, for example, um, you were told that you were guilty of an offense, why? Because in with 95% certainty, based on the material available to it, the computer has concluded that, uh, we would be quite, quite wary. Uh, and so this is another example where it's not merely the quality of the decision that we're looking at, but the reasons for decision and the person making it the decision that become important. So all of this is to say that AI does pose some challenges to existing regulation the more it moves in the direction of fast, autonomous and opaque decision making. So how do we deal with this? Well, for about 70 years, all we had was this guy. Uh, some of you might recognize Isaac Asimov, uh, and I'm not proposing to go through his three laws of robotics that were introduced in a short story in 1942. Uh, but I will tell you that if his three laws had worked, his literary career would have been very brief. Uh, and indeed, the reason he's such an interesting author is precisely because those laws don't work. Uh, and indeed, even the very first story, uh, which introduced the, sort, the norms, the rules, um, uh, it, uh, it involved a clash between the second and third, which was only resolved when the first was invoked as well. And this has been a problem subsequently because jump forward to today and until uh, about 2016, there wasn't a lot of movement here. But now each one of these dots, I don't expect you to be able to read them. Uh, represents a strategy, a framework, a guide, a principle, a set of ethical frameworks uh, to govern artificial intelligence or robotics. And to me, this is a problem because it presents the difficulty posed by AI as both too hard and too simple. It suggests that it's hard because there's this idea that you've got to reinvent the wheel, come up with all these new principles. It suggests that it's a little bit simple because um, if you could just come up with the right list of rules, then all the problems will go away. But again, Asimov's career shows that it's not simply a matter of coming up with neat principles. Uh, it's more the devil being in the detail. And so if you actually, rather than reading those 180 or so uh, different regimes, what you end up with is six principles. There are slight variations, but basically all of them seem to suggest that you need human control, some kind of transparency, AI systems should be safe, accountable, non-discriminatory, and privacy or data protection should be respected. The problem with this, is basically most of this is just another way of saying AI systems should comply with the law. To say that they should be safe just means product liability regime should apply, accountability means civil and criminal law, non-discrimination broadly human rights should apply, and data protection should be respected. So you shouldn't be able to do through an AI system uh, what you can't do uh, on your own. Human control and transparency are however areas in which I think there is an argument uh, that we do need some new rules and in particular, where international law might have a role to play uh, in guarding against uh, the development of uh, AI systems that are either uncontrollable or uncontainable. So how should we go about doing that? Well, 
Um, what I would like to suggest is that um, there might be some lessons from a, uh, a technological development around the same time that Asimov was writing uh, that might shed some light on the current dilemma. And that technological development is nuclear energy. Uh, because around the same time that Asimov published his first short story, uh, introducing the three laws of robotics, the world's first nuclear reactor was being built under the viewing stand of a football field on the University of Chicago. Uh, now, there'd been some misgivings about initiating a chain reaction in the middle of a densely populated city, but Enrico Fermi, the Italian physicist leading the experiment, calculated that it was safe to do so. The reaction was a major step in the development of nuclear energy, but it was also one of the earliest technical achievements of the Manhattan Project, the US-led initiative during the Second World War that culminated in the atomic bombs that incinerated Hiroshima and Nagasaki two and a half years later. Now, the scientists involved at the time knew that their work had the potential for creation as well as destruction. And after the conclusion of the war, that was the subject of the very first resolution passed by the General Assembly of the UN in January 1946. It created a commission tasked with recommending how to eliminate such weapons while enabling all nations to benefit from peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Five months later, the US, Britain and Canada proposed that a new international organization be given exclusive control of all aspects of nuclear power from the ownership of raw materials to the operation of nuclear power plants. The Soviet Union rejected the plan, a rift that came to be seen as both a cause and a consequence of the Cold War. And it was another seven years before the US president, the next US president, Dwight Eisenhower, presented an alternative idea to the UN. If the first plan had been utopian, Eisenhower's Adams for Peace address was idealistic in a different way. Instead of concentrating materials and expertise in supranational bodies, they would be disseminated widely, encouraging states to use them for peaceful purposes in exchange for a commitment to renouncing the search for the bomb. Now, I submit that the history of efforts to safeguard nuclear power are relevant to the modern challenge of regulating artificial intelligence for at least three reasons. The first is as an example of a nuclear of a technology with enormous potential for good and ill that has for the most part been used positively. Nuclear power, though currently out of favor, is one of few realistic short-term energy alternatives to hydrocarbons. Its use in medicine and agriculture is more accepted and widespread. Now observers from the dark days of the Cold War anticipated this, but would have been pleasantly surprised to learn that nuclear weapons had not been used in conflict after 1945, and that even today only a handful of states possess them, the better part of a century later. The second reason I think the analogy is uh, relevant is that the grand bargain at the heart of the IAEA, created four years after Eisenhower's speech, was that the beneficial purposes of technology could be distributed in tandem with a mechanism to ensure that those are the only purposes for which it is applied. And a third reason for the comparison is that much like Fermi and his colleagues, the scientists deeply involved in AI research have been among the most vocal, calling for international regulation. So it's quite common, for example, to have neo-Luddites warning about technology, the way people are sort of ranting about how vaccination has 5G things stuck, get stuck inside it. But the people warning about AI include those like Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, and others. So people who actually understand the problems. So, uh, and sorry, yes, these are some of the examples. Um, the various guides, frameworks, and principles that have been proposed were largely driven by scientists with states tending to follow rather than lead. As the nuclear non-proliferation regime shows, however, good norms are necessary, but not sufficient for effective regulation. So the, the full article and the, indeed the chapter that's, um, that considers this at length uh, looks at the institutional possibilities for regulation with options raising from, ranging from completely free markets to global control by an international organization. In between lie more or less formal industry and sectoral associations, as well as public agencies at the national and international level. So rather than laying these out as a menu, a more helpful approach is to focus not on this, on the supply of regulation, but on the demand for regulation. And here, this takes me back to autonomous vehicles and the comparison with uh, lethal autonomous weapons and, and certain forms of outsourcing. Because basically, I think we can think of the, the, the risks associated with AI in three buckets. The first is the management of risks. There are some situations where all we really care about is safety. 
uh, that we want to optimize the benefits, if you like, a kind of utilitarian calculus. How do we get the benefits of automation while minimizing the risks? So to give you a concrete example, how do we make sure that the driverless vehicles are safe? Secondly, however, I do think there are some red lines, both in terms of human control and transparency. So human control, to me at least, the, the short-term area of human control is that we shouldn't have uncontrollable AI weapons making independent decisions without meaningful human control about life or death scenarios. Uh, and that I think is a red line that the International Committee of the Red Cross is advocating, uh, the, the campaign to stop killer robots is advocating, but I would link it with other potential red lines at the moment, more in the realm of science fiction, but as the possibility of artificial general intelligence, for example, becomes more realistic, then the dangers of an uncontrollable or uncontainable AI system uh, might be something we need to pay more attention to. In the meantime, another area where we do need red lines is in the area of transparency. Uh, not transparency in the narrow European sense of a right to an explanation for an adverse decision, but transparency in that it should be, there should be limits on the development of AI systems that are impossible to understand and impossible to trace back, at least have those two qualities. So we shouldn't have untraceable AI systems that can operate in the wild. Uh, and I, again, the paper and the book look at this in more detail. Um, not all risks need to be simply managed, however. Um, a third category really links to the, the important role of states. Uh, and this is the legitimate exercise of public powers. Because this is a different kind of challenge posed by AI, where we've seen governments around the world increasingly relying on technology. And the analogy I draw here is actually with another international phenomenon, which is mercenarism or um, the private military and security companies, where there are limits, or at least most states believe there should be limits on a, a government's ability to outsource public powers to other entities. And I think there's an important analogy to draw here between outsourcing of for example, war fighting powers to mercenaries and the outsourcing of governmental decisions to AI systems. Uh, and essentially, if a government shouldn't be allowed to outsource what in the US context is called an inherently governmental function, if a government can't outsource that to a private company, it shouldn't be able to outsource it to a machine either. That governments shouldn't be outsourcing this, these decisions, not because the AI system will make a worse decision, but because the legitimacy of the government decision is not or at least not only because the decision is linked with the fact that the decision is a good one or a bad one, the primary reason for the legitimacy of a government decision is because of the identity of the decision maker and the process for holding him or her accountable for it. Okay, so the paper goes into more detail on, on the roles of states, uh, but, uh, but what can we do at the international level? So AI systems, uh, thus far I've talk, talked mostly about the domestic level, but AI systems are not merely a problem for international organizations to manage. They may undermine such organizations themselves. In part, this is because AI systems represent a shift of power away from the state. This is true indirectly through enabling citizens to access information and engage in transactions without the intermediation of traditional public authorities. But they may also pose a direct threat to the state through undermining faith in institutions or processes, spreading fake news and manipulating elections to pick an extreme but hardly fantastical example. Historically, international organizations have been ineffective at best at re responding to technological innovation. If regulation tends to lag at the domestic level, it trails internationally. Sovereign equality and the need to reach consensus encourage a lowest common denominator approach to norms, which can sometimes take years or decades to negotiate. Uh, and earlier we were just talking with our two international law commissioners about the, the relative speed with which the ILC operates these days, uh, but still decision making and the, the formation of treaties can take a long time. Two relevant areas of modest success on the part of international law are banning of particular weapons and facilitating global connectivity. From the 1868 St. Petersburg Declaration on Exploding Bullets to more recent attempts to ban landmines and nuclear weapons, international humanitarian law has sought to mitigate human suffering in conflict. Um, this is extended to more recent concerns raised by lethal autonomous weapon systems. And sorry, I'm obliged to put up at least one Terminator photo during this presentation. This is my only one. International organizations have also supported globalization. One of the oldest such bodies is the International Telecommunications Union, old enough that its original name was actually the International Telegraph Union. Though incorporated as a special agency of the UN, proposals that it should play a greater role in regulating content on the internet 
were met with alarm by many stakeholders, uh, wary that it would restrict the free flow of information online. And you can you'd imagine if you had to get a lowest common denominator approach to governments agreeing on how to regulate the internet, how, how problematic that could be. So when it's narrow and defined or very clear and well agreed, the international community can be affected. But the international record is patchier on providing other public goods. As the ongoing pandemic demonstrates, coordinating a global response to a crisis remains extremely difficult when national interests clash. Global action, acts, sorry, global action is easiest when the goal is both narrow and shared. In relation to the environment, for example, success in preserving the ozone layer from the damage caused by chlorofluorocarbons can be contrasted with the far greater barriers to addressing global climate change. Even if there is political will and relative clarity about the activity to be regulated, international law will be ineffective if there's, if there's no agreement on the applicable norms, if conduct cannot be attributed to states or other actors at the international level, or if the consequences for breaches are inadequate. Uh, and uh, sorry, I'm just endorsing the, the comment in the chat. I'm getting towards the end and I do want your questions. So if, uh, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or, uh, or raise your hand when we move on into the, the interactive part. Even if, there is inter if there's political will and relative clarity, international law will be ineffective, ineffective if there's no agreement on the applicable norms, if conduct cannot be attributed to states or other actors at the international level, or if the consequences for breaches are inadequate. So on norms, sorry, on norms, uh, international law generally does not prohibit activities by states unless they've specifically consented to the prohibition. Customary international law does re re regulate certain transboundary harms States are obliged to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction and control do not cause harm to other states or areas beyond national control. In limited circumstances, this has been expanded by treaty into strict liability. The 1972 Space Liability Convention, for example, provides an interesting model whereby a state is absolutely liable to pay compensation for damage caused on the surface of the earth by space objects launched from its territory. Another possibility, for the most part, however, Due diligence is all that's required based on the nature of their activity, scientific knowledge at the time and capabilities of the state in question. As long as these are satisfied, the state will not generally be responsible for unintentional or accidental acts, including malicious acts by rogue, rogue actors. In such cases, the state's obligation is limited to notification of potentially affected states, though in the case of catastrophic risks, that may be insufficient to avert the threat. In the absence of a treaty then, the obligations with respect to AI systems that pose transboundary threats from polluting a river, say, to a general AI capable of seizing military assets would be due diligence in attempting to prevent the harm and notification if it materializes. What about attribution? Well, the International Law Commission grappled with this topic for half a century, finally pro producing draft articles that are now accepted as reflecting custom. In general, a state is responsible for the acts of persons or entities exercising governmental authority. The term governmental authority is not defined as it depends on the particular society, its history and traditions. Responsibility of the state encompasses situations that involve an independent discretion or power to act on the part of a person or entity, even if in doing so, the entity exceeds its authority or contravenes instructions while acting in that capacity. This would cover, for example, AI systems used by government agencies and subcontractors, even if the AI system subsequently went beyond intended protocols. The acts of private individuals or corporations would not be covered directly, but the state may have specific treaty commitments or, custom, or, or, or customary obligations to guard against transboundary harm. Failure to satisfy those, at least, would be attributable to the state. Situations may also arise where it's difficult to attribute conduct to any particular state or indeed to any actor at all. That's a practical rather than normative challenge, already well known in the context of cybercrime. It points, however, to a potential red line that I touched on earlier that could be demanded globally, a requirement to ensure that the conduct of AI systems remains traceable back to an entity with presence in at least one state. The biggest hurdle for international law, however, is the difficulty of enforcing compliance. This weakness of international law, however, is, you can argue, a feature rather than a bug. Stricter laws would have fewer adherents. More robust institutions would have fewer members. Nonetheless, Mismanaged expectations can lead to frustration when collective action problems manifest, as in the case of climate change or pandemics, for example, where international coordination and cooperation are entrusted to institutions lacking the power to impose either. 
Despite all this, uh, it remains the case that effective regulation of AI does require norms and institutions that operate at the global level. The most common prescription is a multi-stakeholder model like ICANN, the Internet, Internet Commission uh, on uh, the Internet, Internet Corporation on Assigned Names and Numbers. The intuitive appeal is understandable given the overlap of subject matter and personnel with the AI industry. The actual functions of ICANN, however, are confined to coordinating the domain name system and resolving disputes, however. This is important, but the need for a global body to regulate AI goes beyond technical coordination. In December 2018, Canada and France announced plans to establish an international panel on AI modeled on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, established some 30 years earlier. It was later renamed the Global Partnership on AI with a secretariat at the OECD in Paris. The analogy with climate change acknowledges that AI poses a similar collective action problem for the global system. Yet the link with the OECD and an emphasis on human rights point less to concerns about efficient management than a desire to exclude China. Increasing the risk of a bifurcated, bifurcated internet and approach to AI, uh, which is the antithesis of a global response. These less ambitious or more political proposals lack both the normative teeth and the aspiration to universalism, the depth and breadth that I think is necessary to address the global challenge. Here, the IAEA offers a better model as an example of a regime that confronted a regulatory deficit directly, how to limit the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and embraced the politics of the situation openly, seeking buy-in from non-nuclear states by allowing access to technology while giving nuclear states assurances that their military advantage would not be lost, or at least not lost until some unspecified point in the future. As I mentioned earlier, the IIEA was created at a time of high, perhaps excessive optimism concerning the potential for nuclear energy tempered by fears of its weaponization. The agency's stated objectives are to accelerate and enlarge the contribution of atomic energy to peace, health and prosperity throughout the world, while ensuring that this does not further any military purpose. The first of these objectives was pursued through technology transfer, although dreams of electricity too cheap to meter never materialized and more was achieved in medicine and agriculture than power generation. That second objective eventually saw the signing of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, while broader standard setting was, initially at least, an incidental role for the IAEA. Um, so in the paper, um, what I suggest is that maybe it's statute, maybe the statute of the IAEA does provide a, uh, a possible model uh, in what I've called an international artificial intelligence agency. So a hypothetical IA, IA could draw upon the experience of its nuclear counterpart in three ways. First, you could have an explicit bargain that could bridge the medium term interests of the most technologically advanced states, the US and China, for example, and the short term needs, needs of others. Those states with the most advanced lethal autonomous weapon systems today, for example, may come to see that a world in which such weapons are widely distributed would be deeply unstable, or if or when advances towards general AI indicate the dangers of a superintelligence, hopes that technology could be kept secret, recall Fermi's warning that Earth will not cease in its motion around the sun. That was Fermi's warning that it was going to be impossible to keep the nuclear secrets secret for very long. A second lesson from the IAEA is to have clear and limited authority with a graduated approach to enforcement. The main red line proposed here would be the weaponization of AI, understood narrowly as the development of lethal autonomous weapon systems lacking meaningful human control, and more broadly as the development of AI systems posing a real risk of being uncontrollable or uncontainable. Now there's widespread agreement that AI systems should in theory remain under human control. And at present, it does not appear to be, and there doesn't appear to be an immediate danger that an uncontrollable AI in the sense of a sentient being will be created anytime soon. There are, however, many examples of computer viruses that have gotten out of control. The most realistic prospect here would be that states could agree to the principle of control with periodic reviews on progress towards general AI and an accompanying reconsideration of whether limitation on further research uh, is required. Transparency does raise questions that distinct political questions will answer, uh, distinct political systems will answer in their own way. In terms of a red line at the international level, however, it would be to require that states prevent AI systems being deployed in a manner that cannot be traced back to a legal person, otherwise identifiable as the owner, operator, or manufacturer. A third learning point uh, coming from the IAEA is the mundane yet important point of structure, which I won't go into for reasons of time, uh, but I think there are some lessons to be learned there. So let me wrap up. 
One consequence of Eisenhower's Adams for, Peace, Adams for Peace speech was the biggest scientific conference the world had ever seen. The second Geneva conference held in 1958 was nearly twice as large. It was a period of euphoria and optimism with many states establishing nuclear research and development programs, even as the IAEA statute was being drafted and ratified. Now, I appreciate that the limits of an analogy between nuclear energy and AI are pretty obvious. Nuclear energy refers to a well-defined set of processes related to specific materials that are unevenly distributed around the world. AI is an amorphous term and its applications are extremely wide. The IAEA's grand bargain focused on weapons that are expensive to build and difficult to hide. Weaponization of AI promises to be neither. Nevertheless, some kind of mechanism at the global level is essential if regulation of AI is going to be effective. The larger paper argues that industry standards will be important for managing risk and states will be a vital part of enforcement with gaps to be plugged by an AI ombudsperson or equivalent institutions at the national level. In an interconnected world, however, uh, regulation premised on the sovereignty of territorially bound states is not fit for purpose. And so my hypothetical IAIA is offered as one way of addressing that structural problem. Yet the biggest difference between attempts to control nuclear power in the 1950s and AI today is that when Eisenhower addressed the UN, the effects of the nuclear blasts on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still being felt. The dread secret, as he called it, of those weapons, he warned, was no longer confined to the United States. The Soviet Union had tested its own devices and the knowledge was likely to be shared by others, perhaps by all others. Doing nothing was to accept the, the hopeless finality that two atomic colossi are doomed malevolently to eye each other indefinitely across a trembling world, as Eisenhower said. Now, there is no such threat from AI at present and certainly no comparably visceral evidence of its destructive power. Absent that threat, getting agreement on meaningful regulation of AI at the global level will be difficult. It's conceivable that AI itself will help solve the problems raised here. Uh, if it does not, however, global institutions that might have prevented the first true AI emergency will need to be created in a hurry if they are to prevent the second. Uh, and so with that, I look forward to your questions, your comments and a rich discussion to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Simon. That was really um, a very comprehensive, rich, and thought-provoking presentation. I think the students, our uh, participants, really um, were given a lot to think about, and I hope we'll get a lot of questions as well. Um, and I appreci appreciated um, looking at uh, AI as something that really, it's a bit, perhaps we mystify it too much. And I think um, your presentation helps to demystify aspects of it. Um, it's maybe not as new as we think. What do we mean by AI? Uh, and also the analogy with um, uh, the nuclear um, development. So having said that, I want to now uh, take up some of the questions we have. Um, let me start with um, a question from Costa. Ramadani Baki, and you're welcome to actually ask the question yourself or I can read them. If you're happy to turn the video on, you can directly pose the question. And please, please do everyone turn on your videos if you're able to. It's much yeah. nicer to see you uh, yeah. live. So um, I see, no, do you want, so I, I, I don't see, uh, Costa, are you there? Should I go ahead and read that question then? Hello, Professor. I would like to know how can autonomous- He's just unmuting. Hi, Costa. Oh, he is. Oh, perfect. Okay. I can't see everyone. Please go Hello, ahead. Hello, Professor. Great, Costa. Thank you. Go ahead and ask your question. Well, I would like to know how can autonomous weapons or AI-generated weapons can comply with the principle of international humanitarian law, especially the principle of distinction, the necessity. And uh, in your opinions, which mode of weapons can effectively comply with the principle of IHL between the human beings controlled weapons and AI weapons? How do you see about this question? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Costa. Um, and it's, it's a good question. Of course, we're using AI in a pretty, pretty loose uh, sense here. Because uh, there are all sorts of automated weapons 
Uh, so a landmine, for example, is essentially an automated weapon. It responds to an external stimulus and then blows up. It's not making distinctions. A heat-seeking missile will also follow a program. So what we're talking about really is uh, when a and, and the, the red line that most of us are thinking of here is when a, uh, a system is making a determination, for example, um, whether a target is civilian or military, whether military necessity uh, allows for the, um, the, the particular target to be uh, engaged. Um, and uh, at least in theory, um, it is possible to answer these questions and it is possible to come up with an AI system that goes through a similar process uh, of, uh, of evaluation and makes a determination. The reason for meaningful human control, I would argue, uh, you, you can make two arguments for it. Um, the first is uh, there is an argument that merely developing a weapon that makes such choices is itself a war crime uh, in the same way that indiscriminate, an indiscriminate attack uh, is potentially a war crime. Uh, if you develop a weapon that is going to attack indiscriminately, that in itself could be a war crime. Um, a second way of looking at it, however, is that meaningful human control is necessary not only because you will have better decisions, uh, but because the purpose of war, uh, the purpose of the regulation of war is both, it's not just to minimize suffering uh, or to distinguish between civilians and combatants and so on, uh, but it's also uh, to limit this, uh, to, to force us to grapple morally with the problems of warfare. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the thought scenarios is if you did have uh, an entire army made up of autonomous systems, among the problems would be that uh, it might therefore be a lot easier to go into war, to go to war. And this is not hypothetical. We've already seen with the emergence of drones uh, in particular, but not only by the United States, uh, it lowers the threshold for engaging in military activity uh, because the risk to a, uh, at least a human soldier on your side uh, is vastly reduced. Uh, we've seen it also with the use of contractors. Um, in the Iraq war of uh, 2003, the second largest contingent of forces outside the United States was actually military contractors ahead even of the size of the British forces. So for these reasons, I think, I think implicit in your question, I, I share a wariness of, uh, of, of the ability of an AI system to comply with the law in a meaningful sense but if it's merely in that narrow sense of can you apply the principle of distinction and necessity, um, that's actually the kind of thing that AI systems are getting quite good at because it's like determining whether is something a cat or not a cat? Is it a combatant or not a combatant? I can imagine that working, uh, but even so, I wouldn't want to entrust someone's life to it. Right, wonderful. Um, all right, so I'm going in the order that the questions came. The next one will be, Mohamed Reza Musavi, um, you have your hand up, please. Hello, Professor. Um, actually, my question is like a cost question, but I want to uh, make an example, an argument. That's when, in, for example, in an armed conflict, when a child puts on, uh, puts up the one toy gun and triggered to the fully autonomous weapon, that is fully autonomous weapon, which is not human, uh, watch out. How can, uh, how can the fully autonomous weapon be accurate enough to being a distinction between the gun and the child? Uh, how could it be possible and use uh, and apply the principle of proportionality and distinction to these situations? Thank you so much. Yeah, so this is, this is where uh, there's a kind of controversial response to this, which is that, well, uh, should we be holding machines to a higher standard than we hold humans? Um, and so I, I would put the same question back to you. What happens if a soldier makes that distinction, if, if a soldier fails to identify that it's a child? Now, at the moment, AI systems, one reason why AI systems, uh, why, why driving, for example, is so difficult, uh, is not that driving is difficult. Driving is actually pretty easy. Driving with other humans around you is a nightmare. Uh, and so that is, that is a complex question. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't had the advantages, uh, advances in um, driverless vehicles that people think. Uh, and it is, and your question rightly says that, highlights that it's a real challenge how you could distinguish. Um, but that's, that's a solvable problem. Um, and I, I think on that kind of, question of computer vision, the advances in computer vision, um, advances in machine learning systems. I, I think it's at least theoretically possible 
for an AI system to make those kinds of distinctions. If a human can make those distinctions, a, a computer can make those distinctions based on similar training, similar information, and eventually if you get enough data. The question implicit, however, in your comment is, should an AI system be doing that? And here I would say that the reason why I would share what I assume is your visceral feeling that an AI system shouldn't be making that determination, shouldn't be deciding to engage and kill the child, uh, is not only because it's going to make the wrong decision. Even if it's making the right decision, there's a difference between a machine doing it and what it means for the life of that child and a person who does it. Uh, because if the person does it, we can feel moral outrage, we can try and hold that person to account. Uh, and as unsatisfying as that will be for the child, his or her parents and so on, uh, at least there can be some kind of reckoning. But if it's an AI system, um, then uh, this is kind of the definition of that casualty of war being treated as, as a kind of means rather than as an end. So yeah, long way of saying, I don't, I, I think the technical problem is overcomable, is capable of being overcome, but I think the moral question will remain. Yeah, interesting. And I think the, the question about the level of uh, uh, standard, whether um, AI should be held to a higher level or not, is, a, is an interesting one. Um, but we have a lot of questions. So next, um, Atul Alexander, you have a written question, but I invite you, if you can, to turn your screen on and ask your question directly. Yeah, thank you, Professor Chesterman, for the wonderful presentation. My question is with regard to just uh, at Bello. So whether the incorporation of artificial intelligence, whether it could change uh, the way Article 51 and para 2 para 4 is interpreted. Right now, the yardstick of attribution is very high, uh, taking a cue from the Nicaragua case and uh, the subsequent cases of DRC Uganda. So whether it will alter the dynamics of how art Article 51 is interpreted in the context of just at Bello. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. I mean, there's uh, a lot of this goes beyond, well beyond artificial intelligence. So I'll, I'll address two kinds of issues. One is what happens when there's a cyber attack. So, and this is the Talon manual. There's a lot of discussion about in what circumstances um, uh, an attack on critical infrastructure, but not involving kinetic force or a physical manifestation, um, to what extent that can amount to an armed attack within the meaning of Article 51 or a use of force within the meaning of Article 2, Paragraph 4. So that, that's been going on for some time, and we've seen examples, at least alleged examples, of attacks. Uh, I think Estonia, there were, there, periodically there are allegations that, um, uh, that, that, well, they're no longer allegations. There are states that clearly have set up um, cyber hacking organizations, which they then use to uh, conduct offensive operations. Uh, and one of, the, one of the gray areas is this more like espionage or does it rise to the level of an attack? And so one threshold is, is if there's a physical manifestation. So if, for example, you merely go in to steal a secret, that's probably not an armed attack. But if you go in and not hardly a hypothetical example, um, cause a nuclear research facility to overload, uh, then that would seem to have a physical manifestation. And some people would argue that, that amounts to an armed attack. Separate question raised by AI, however, is that what happens, again, not entirely theoretical, if you have a drone attack uh, and the drones are operating autonomously and you are unable to attribute that back to a state. Uh, so in what circumstances could that amount to an armed attack? Uh, and here the challenge is that the UN Charter is premised on an interstate model of warfare. Uh, and so an armed attack or a use of force means by one member state against another member state. Uh, and if you can't attribute it, in what circumstances could you respond? So this is also not entirely new. I mean, we've just had the 20th anniversary of September 11, 2001, uh, where there was an attack on the United States that was not directly attributable to Afghanistan, but uh, Security Council Resolution 1368 um, said that essentially uh, appeared to expand the definition of self-defense to include states that harbor um, uh, those who attack a state. Uh, and so you could have a situation where if you harbored an AI system or produced an AI system that caused an attack, uh, that that might be an argument. But, but it's, a, it's a great question that uh, hopefully, hopefully will remain theoretical for some time to come, uh, but it's going to be a real challenge to the use of force in particular. Great, wonderful. We have more, more questions. Um, 
following. And here's the order, so everyone knows the order. I know the um, anticipation when waiting to ask a question. We have James Lowe, Gil Anthony Aquino, and then Shesadi Talib, and Lawrence Atieno Odur. So, uh, James, you're next. Hello, hello, Professor. Uh, thank you, thank you for the lecture, and it's it's been a while. Um, I wanted to pick up on your point um, about the comparison between uh, international nuclear law and um, AI, and I think you alluded to this um, towards the end of your of your presentation. Um, for international nuclear law, to to my very layman view, I think it's much easier to regulate because we're dealing with physical, um, tangible um, source material like uranium ore, for example. Um, whereas for AI, um, it's it's on it's digital. Like, um, what's what's to stop, for example, maybe a, a whiz kid sitting um, in his parents' bedroom just writing a source code and putting it on the dark web, for example? Um, how would you even? Where would you even start regulating something like that? I mean, firstly, it's not a state. Second, it's a private actor, and with technological advances like the dark web and all that, isn't that going to be very uh, nearly impossible? as far as I can see it. Yeah, um, so first James, great to see you again. Um, and of course you're right, it's it's gonna be hard, but I mean the nuclear, one of the things that's really striking about nuclear energy, it, it's 1940s technology. Uh, and yet um, the number of states that have nuclear weapons is very small. Um, we've had long standing fears about terrorists getting hold of nuclear facilities and it's, it's a hassle to get hold of, but it's hardly impossible. Uh, if you really want to, if you're a very motivated person, uh, there are ways to develop um, sort of at least dirty bombs. Uh, and the reason that hasn't happened is partly because there are some challenges, but mainly because states regulate it. Uh, and so the only way in which this would work is if you had some kind of regulation. Now, is that going to make it impossible for a genius whiz kid to, to come up with a computer program? No, um, but you want to make it much harder. You want to stigmatize things and maybe uh, other analogies would be with chemical or biological weapons uh, where there is a stigma associated with them and so if you had a stigma associated with the development of at least a lethal autonomous weapon and potentially with uh, the the prospect of a of a truly uncontainable um, um, computer system then that's my hope but but you're absolutely right the international regime would not be enough you would need to have the international norm to coordinate state action uh, and some level of um, some level of uh, uh, inspection and so on, uh, but the primary way in which we restrain behaviour across the board is not actually the law clamping down on people and stopping them doing things. It's the law reinforcing a moral framework that that leads to people not doing things themselves. Uh, and so, not to draw too simplistic analogy, but around the world, murder is a crime and murder obviously happens, but not, not as many, not as often as it could. And, and the reason is people choose not to murder. Uh, and if you reinforce that standard, it's possible. Uh, so yeah, long way of saying, of course, you're correct that the analogy is limited, that a, a treaty would hardly be enough. But if a treaty could reinforce um, national laws uh, and reinforce moral frameworks such that uh, we all believe that it was necessary to maintain human control and transparency, I think that would at least deal with most of the cases, if not necessarily all of them. Great, thank you. Um, next on our list of questions, we have Jill Anthony Aquino. There you are, thank, yes. Thank, thank you, uh, professors. Um, I know, professor, you've been talking about attribution quite a bit, but if you could indulge me um, to talk about it some more. Uh, I'm just thinking of how difficult it might be to, to pinpoint attribution uh, in, uh, in artificial intelligence issues, especially because of the nature, it's ephemeral nature, you know, of, um, number one and number two of how many actors are actually contributing towards this. You have the uh, the user of the technology, the, the makers of the technology, and those who are affected, um, which territory they've been, are they using VPN to hide their tracks, etc. So do you think that um, the current governance of attribution, particularly the draft article or the articles of state responsibility, let's say, is enough? Or do you think that, um, uh, uh, we should at at attack attribution, or we should um, go after uh, these uses for, for more in a more domestic level or more regional level, considering how difficult it might be to have an international agreement. Yeah, um, so it's it's a slight challenge at the national level already, even if someone isn't trying to cover their tracks. 
But their product liability will deal with many cases. And so it's either owner, operator, or manufacturer that you would go after. But you, you do highlight the hard case. If someone is motivated to cover their tracks, uh, it can be very hard. Uh, and this is obviously not hypothetical. It goes back, I think, to, to James's point about the difficulty of confining this. And you just think about the role that um, the, the impact that computer viruses can have, that someone can release a virus into the wild, uh, a computer virus, uh, and it can be very hard to attribute that back to anyone, even though we sometimes um, might believe that a state was behind something. Uh, it can be very hard to, to establish that. Uh, and those states with the capacity to trace something back to another state uh, might choose not to reveal that information for, for whatever reason. In terms of the, the state responsibility argument, I mean, I think there is at least a, um, an argument that, um, that there is some attribution to the state if it's a uh, person or entity exercising governmental authority, and that's pretty broad. Uh, but uh, if you go far beyond that, uh, there's at least a responsibility to guard against transboundary harm. Uh, and that might not be much, but it's not nothing. So if here the example is maybe comparing it with pollution uh, and that if a, if, a, if a state is unable to contain pollution within its, within its boundaries, uh, then there might be some responsibility for that. Uh, but you're absolutely right. But if, a, if a, an entity is motivated to cover its tracks, uh, it can be very hard to track uh, and, and to establish attribution even to the, to the identification of a state from which it came, if, if VPNs are used to sort of um, divert attention such that it looks like something is coming from elsewhere. So a long way of saying, yes, it's gonna be a real practical challenge. That's not the same as saying it's a normative challenge. Uh, and international law is full of cases where we, we agree on the norms, but struggle over the application. Uh, and, uh, and we're clearly at an early stage with this, but if we can at least agree on the norms, if we can agree on this idea of human control on baseline levels of transparency, that at least would be a start. Uh, and then we try and work out how to apply them in practice. Thank you. Um, all right, we'll continue. And I know we're running out of time. I don't know if you can indulge us for an extra five minutes, Simon. We have so oh. many questions. Fantastic. Um, great, next, uh, Shehzadi Talib. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor, for that insightful and wonderful lecture. Um, my question is more bit related to the principles you actually uh, listed. Uh, one of that was non-discrimination or the human rights. Uh, while working on the health sector and the discrimination on certain basis uh, of the artificial intelligence, I came across a, a basically a implicit kind of bias in use of artificial technology, uh, like artificial intelligence in recognizing the facial faces or the skin color and something. So uh, world is, uh, in my view, uh, we have been subject to certain discriminations already at many levels, but when we introduce the artificial intelligence, it has also been a kind of subject to implicit bias because uh, we don't know who is going to develop the uh, algorithm and how it is going to uh, diagnose uh, cancer, some particular cancer in like uh, people, uh, by patients. So um, my, uh, my question is how do the international law or uh, the international agencies would uh, handle this bias and what are like, uh, should, um, and th there should be committees accountable or the developers should be accountable for that so, so that that bias must be reduced at most of the levels. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so AI bias is, is a fascinating topic. Uh, and what's, it's interesting to me, at least in two ways. First, that it reveals all sorts of biases, which is, which is interesting. And in addition to the case you mentioned, there are famous cases of, I mean, Amazon, relied on a resume screening, screening uh, piece of software that concluded from 10 years of history that Amazon did not want to hire any women. Uh, and Amazon subsequently realized that was not what they wanted, uh, but, uh, but that was what the, the training revealed. Uh, and so if you blindly apply an AI system, a machine learning model, all it really does is extrapolate from past data. And if your past data has either actual or implicit bias, uh, all it will do is replicate that into the future. The second thing though that's really interesting about AI is that unlike humans, AI, at least AI at the moment, tends not to lie to you. So if you interrogate an AI system and say, are you biased against women or 
people of color, it will tell you if it is in a way that a human never would. Uh, and this goes back to this question of what standard do you hold AI systems to? I mean, I've done some work on whether AI should be, whether judges should be replaced by AI and bias comes up. But we don't, when a judge makes a decision, we don't, we don't ask her to submit to functional magnetic resonance imagery of the brain to check that the reasons she's giving are the actual reasons for the decision. Uh, rather, we tend to believe what, she's held, what she tells us. Uh, with AI, we're, we're able to interrogate it much more. So to your question, what, what should, what should, how should we treat this at the international level? Well, I think two things come up. One, the state should be held to the same standards that it normally would. You shouldn't be able to do something through AI that you couldn't do yourself. You can't outsource a decision, reveal it to be biased and say, well, don't blame me, it was the AI system. Well, you asked the system to do it, you're responsible. Uh, and secondly, and more generally, there are all sorts of system, all sorts of decisions that governments shouldn't be outsourcing in the first place. Uh, that they can they can draw upon the technology, use the technology. No one would say that a, a, a governmental decision maker shouldn't use a calculator, for example. They should be doing all their long division by hand. Of course, you should use the technology, um, but particularly for government decisions, particularly for decisions that can affect the rights and obligations of individuals, you've then got to stand by those decisions. Uh, and then if that means you are limited in the complexity of the AI model that you're outsourcing things to, then so be it. Uh, if the cost of, of that is a little less accuracy in the eyes of the machine and a little more accountability in the eyes of the public, that's a trade-off worth making. Wonderful. Uh, great questions and um, continue on. We have uh, Laurence Atiena Odour. Uh, and after that, two more questions and then we close. Laurence? Uh uh, thank you so much. I'm um, sorry I cannot turn on my video right now, uh, but my question is uh, a bit theoretical and in relation to humanitarian law, that is. Um, uh, okay, seeing the development of artificial intelligence and the fact that um, a bit of in artificial intelligence will be used in, in a Waging, in waging wars between states, um, will, there be, will there be a need to uh, W won't there be a sort of inequality because um, we, we recognize the fact that states develop different, differently. Um, there are states which will be quite advanced in artificial intelligence and there will be states where, uh, there'll be states where um, it won't be as developed, it won't be developed as much. And um, will there be a need to also, won't there be, won't there be a witness in, uh, in determining um, the extent of the extent of attacks which the state should actually, um, should, which is uh, the extent of attacks which the state should um, impose on the other states because of um, there'll be a sort of balance that will have to be developed due to uh, a competition between artificial intelligence and uh, the human resource or the humans who be involved in the world. Yeah, so an interesting and complex set of ideas there. I mean, the first thing I'd say is that I think AI systems, or well, artificial intelligence is a tool, uh, and it can be a tool used for good or for ill. Um, and on the, on the question of different levels of resources, I think uh, there's a rich discussion going on at the ITU, for example, about AI and the sustainable development goals, uh, because there are all sorts of areas of life where if we could only optimize optimize things. So we can optimize the, the nutritional benefits, optimize education, optimize medicine. Um, you can have great benefits in terms of human development. Um, so that's something to be, uh, that there is a whole conversation how to use the tools of AI and how to distribute them equally. But in the particular context of, uh, of potential conflict, um, it, is, it is a real challenge. And um, I mean, we can see already the extent to which a state has access to drone technology um, those states with the great, with the most powerful long distance drones are able to project power in a way that others can't. Uh, we've seen that with satellite technology that in theory, the space, the laws of space um, apply to everyone. Uh, but in reality, there are only a handful of states that, that actually are active in that environment. Uh, with AI, I mean, one, one sort of medium term potential challenge is if we get to a point where there are lethal autonomous weapon systems, um, that, uh, that are conducting uh, hostilities, uh, you can imagine a situation in which it's almost a, a war crime to put soldiers in their way. 
um, because you're merely going to be destroyed. Uh, and so would that mean that the state with the most powerful lethal autonomous weapons system should therefore just be able to, uh, to walk over other states? And clearly that's a, a ridiculous scenario. Um, but I think it would be a very hard decision if you're, if you're being attacked, for example, your state is being attacked by lethal autonomous weapon systems, do you want to put your soldiers to go in harm's way uh, when all they can do is disable the, the hardware of the enemy uh, while it's their, it's their own lives that is, is at stake? So this is one of the reasons why I think there is this live discussion about limits on lethal autonomous weapon systems. Um, but it's unfortunate that, as we've seen in some other areas, for example, in nuclear weapons, um, the states with the greatest leverage and the greatest power uh, often have the least interest in advancing those debates. Uh, and it tends to be the states that are more likely to be on the receiving end that are warning about the potential dangers. All right, and we are going over time with the last two questions. And thank you so much, Simon, for indulging us really with your extra time, but it's really a wonderful discussion. So we're, we're, Lorenzo, we're, getting, we're all getting paid overtime now, aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely, double. <laughs> um, yes, um, Lorenzo, uh, Rafael Lorenzo. Yes, hi. Name, uh, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a very long name, um, and I, I get that. I get that a lot. Uh, so, yeah. Um, good afternoon, and thanks so much for taking the time for extending and uh, letting me ask my question. I found it very interesting how you highlighted earlier how. These aren't only legal considerations. There are the moral implications of uh, having um, an autonomous um, tool, as, as uh, you described earlier, pull the trigger. And I wonder whether it is simply uh, a moral uh, difference, an ethical difference, uh, but what more an anthropological one. It's, it's one thing to be shot by a bullet. It's, one, it's another thing for having one of our own pull the trigger. And I wonder whether that poses an insurmountable hurdle when it comes to accepting that we are creating um, a machine, uh, so to speak, uh, another another being uh, through um, autonomous weapons. And which, which brings me to the main uh, of my question. When we speak of autonomy and artificial intelligence, do we contemplate this simply as a powerful tool, as a weapon on steroids? Or are we contemplating a creation of a being anew? And I think this carries some implications, particularly um, for state responsibility, as we've discussed, yes, but for individual criminal liability. Because if we imagine the autonomous weapon as a separate agent, then all of a sudden the conversation of effective control over a subordinate, i.e. command responsibility, might come into the picture. But if we imagine AI as a weapon, then we wouldn't be looking at Article 28, but under, as you described earlier, grave breaches of uh, the Geneva Convention. So in, in gist, when we speak of autonomous weapons, do we contemplate this as a being exercising autonomy or are we using autonomy merely to describe what a tool is doing? That's uh, an excellent, excellent question. And indeed a whole chapter in my book, um, oh. because at the, at the domestic level, this, this arises as well. And there is this whole debate about um, AI legal personality. So I'll say a little bit about the domestic level and then apply it at the international level. At the domestic level, on the face of it, it might be attractive uh, because uh, as I said, when it's, things are happening in a fast, autonomous and opaque fashion, the traditional person you blame might not be available. And basically we have legal personality arguments for two reasons either so we can blame someone when things go wrong or potentially reward them when things go right. So blaming them when something goes wrong, I mean, if, if, not, if the driverless car or the, there's the car kills someone and the driver wasn't, didn't have hands on the steering wheel, maybe there was no steering wheel, who do we blame? We blame the car. No, we could blame the manufacturer, we could blame the owner, we could blame the user who got in and told the car to go forward. But in some circumstances, you might want to blame someone the problem that autonomous weapon systems pose in the battlefield is who would that person be? Uh, so is the autonomous weapon system more like a, a, a landmine that just goes off, okay? Then whoever planted the landmine, that, just, that was the decision. Is it more like a horse or a dog that goes wild and then goes off and causes damage? Well, again, the person who brought, introduced that 
uh, animal into the battlefield uh, might be the person to blame. Um, the third situation, this is closer to your analogy, is it like a badly trained soldier who commits a war crime uh, and then that soldier might be to blame, but also the commander who either trained him or her or failed to exercise command responsibility might also be to blame. Um, or is it like a weapon, a missile that just malfunctions? So if a missile blows up a kindergarten because it just went off target or it malfunctioned, that might not necessarily be a war crime as such. So how do you draw that analogy? Who do we blame when things go wrong? Um, I don't think we should go down that path though. I don't think we should, partly because the analogy with, with consciousness and the kind of android fallacy that comes up, you, you, I'm not blaming you for this, but the, the temptation to think that, well, it's autonomous, therefore it's making decisions, therefore it's like me, therefore it's a moral person. I think that's a whole series of, of leaps of logic that don't really make sense yet or for the foreseeable future. So I don't think we should go down that path. Uh, but although I do understand the intuitive appeal. And the main reason we shouldn't go down that path is that the consequence of that, if we did start saying, okay, we ascribe moral agency to the machine, the consequence isn't gonna be that the machine's gonna behave any better. It's that people will behave worse because they will be able to abdicate responsibility. It'll be like um, the equivalent of a corporation so when we set up corporations with limited liability, that's to limit the risk of the individuals behind them. And that's why we say corporations have limited liability, why they're, they're called limited, it's in their name and so on. And we do that for explicit economic reasons. Uh, I don't think we should do that in the context of the laws of war because the only consequence is that you would have limited liability of the people, the commanders who are behind them. Uh, and just to finish the thought on personality, I said, we sometimes talk about personality, things to blame when things go wrong. Um, sometimes we want personality to reward someone when things go right. And so there is, for example, a live debate about whether AI systems that create patentable technology should own that or should be identified as the creator uh, when the human is not, when the human behind it uh, did not him or herself create the technology. Uh, but I, I don't think that holds water either for, for reasons that you can read about in my book. Um, lastly, applying it to the international level, yeah, I think I think this is this is very very early days to be talking about this, uh, but uh, the same reasons why I'd be wary about giving legal personality at the domestic level would apply at the international level because it wouldn't improve behaviour and all it would do is shield abuse. Yeah, this this Thank is really so fascinating but we've come to the last question it really is the last question and i'm going to read it um a professor what is your view on proposals from some ccw state parties and also some international ngos to institute a preemptive ban on lethal autonomous weapon system systems yeah so it specifically mentions out of the loop autonomous weapon system yeah, briefly okay. that's that's the idea that um a human can be either in the loop, meaning he or she has to take a positive decision before things go forward, on the loop or over the loop, meaning you can supervise and then stop, uh, or out of the loop, meaning that there's no human involvement whatsoever. Um, so I think a preemptive ban, you, uh, it's hard to ban technologies when we can't clearly define it, but the, um, the International Committee of the Red Cross has framed this as saying we need to maintain meaningful human control, and I would, I would agree with that. Um, the, uh, there is a push for a moratorium. Um, at the moment, um, even the United States, I think the United States has agreed that it does not want lethal autonomous weapons where there's not even a kill switch, where there's not even an abort function. Uh, at that point, there is, there is agreement. Uh, but we've seen pushing at the limits, and I think there's, there's a UN report that suggests that there was a deployment in 2020 of a, of a drone that was making targeting decisions. Uh, that is deeply problematic. Uh, so the problem with this, as is often the case in international law, it can take a long time uh, to get to an agreement. Uh, that's hard at the best of times, but in an area like this where technology is developing so quickly, and as a couple of, of you have pointed out, the, the cost of that technology is going down, uh, it is very hard to limit behavior, uh, to, to limit the impact of these technologies. Uh, my hope is that if we can at least agree on the questions and on some of the preliminary answers, uh, we'll get to some kind of consensus on red lines, on accountability structures uh, that will avoid the very worst consequences or the, um, 
or at least ensure that when bad things happen, someone, hopefully a human flesh and blood person can be held accountable for them. Great, thank you so much. And, and um, I'm bringing to close what has been a very, very uh, active participation by our students. And I have to say, I, I thank them. I, for me, I was a little worried. It's a, it's a very specialized area whether we would have in questions or not, but I certainly underestimated our participants, but it has a lot to do with the fantastic lecture you gave us, uh, Simon, on this topic that is only gonna grow in importance. And I have to say, I've learned a lot personally. It's an area that I haven't really, have a great deal of knowledge at all about. So uh, Patricia and I thank you so much uh, for this, fantastic lecture and I want to thank all our participants uh, for your engagement, your excellent questions. This is what makes the e-academy the place to be. <laughs> thanks, so, much. and thank, thanks to all of you. This is exactly what I was hoping for, a really rich discussion. I'm certainly thinking more about these topics but I uh, hope it was interesting to you also. And we'll read your book definitely. <laughs> There's a discount so, at Cambridge University Press if you want. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Very good. Well, uh, on behalf of Patricia and I, we say goodbye. And of course, for our uh, participants at the E Academy, uh, dear Professor Jerry Talati will continue tomorrow with his lecture on peace and security. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.